So, uh, my name is uh, Dima, as Jason mentioned. Uh, there you go. Here's my information, uh, my blog, uh, my personal website, whatever, if you want to look me up. Fine. Uh, I'm not a developer per se. I don't really have a job description the way I see it. I just kind of mess around and see what happens, uh, play around with it. Uh, I was kind of uh, when I w when uh, Jason talked to me about doing the Selenium conference first. I imagined like small room, ten people, you know, we'll play around with things. And then I was told, "Hey, look at this size of this room. I mean, it's not intimidating at all." I'm just saying out loud. So, yeah. Anyways, uh, these are a couple of the cool companies I got to work with. I'm currently with Groupon. I've spent couple of years at ThoughtWorks, which was a lot of fun for me. I got to learn some very, very cool things, including getting introduced to Selenium and uh, seeing how it is actually applied in the real world, um, which uh, I, I want to put this up up front. I'm not a developer. Uh, you cannot judge the quality of my code, the elegance, or whatever you want to judge. You cannot judge me on because I'm just saying I'm not a developer. I will make things work for you. I will explore things. I will poke around. I will use PowerShell if somebody forces me to, but I will find a way to make it work. I will let somebody else take care of the uh, making it nice and pretty. So, so the question that uh, a lot of companies ask up front when you suggest doing automation is, well, why do we need it in the first place? Granted, now it's it come it is becoming easier and easier to sell automation to companies than it used to be, but you still need to sometimes put up a fight. I mean, you have the business asking uh, all these questions for uh, these are a couple of them that I've heard. There's a lot more, but you know it is way too expensive to do automation. It is a lot of work. You will need to have a lot of people dedicated to writing automated tests. You will never have enough staff to actually support it full time. It will not just work no matter how you f try it. Uh, the coverage is just one of those things that just kind of floats around. Nobody knows what is being covered, what is not. What are our tests actually testing? Who knows? And finally, um, nobody but the developers can actually understand, look at the test and say, hey, we actually you know, you, you give that uh, regular test cases to a business person and say, okay, do you understand what's going on? Hell no. So, the question to that is, well, we don't need automation. I'm out of here. See you next year. Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. I want to introduce uh, selenium and cucumber. S salt, cucumber, pickles, no? Nobody? Never mind. Uh, cucumber, I'm, I'm hoping that cucumber will help you answer some of those questions that the... Uh, the company might ask you uh, to solve the automation issue. So, uh, quick overview. I want to set the stage, uh, talk about where we are, where you are, uh, give you a quick introduction to Cucumber. I want to show off some cool features about it, but I also want to tell you about some of the pitfalls and some of the difficulties that come with it. So, and somewhere in there, hopefully, you will learn something awesome and make your daily life much happier. So, a couple of assumptions that I have. First of all, I believe that most of you here are a startup or a small business, something like that. If you are from some big company, chances are you would be using QuickTest Pro, not Selenium, so you would not be here to begin with. You are understaffed, but then again, who isn't? You never have enough test coverage. And uh, you constantly have to fight for the time to actually automate the tests. I mean, all the other priorities that are happening, I, I end up doing a lot of manual QA and automated QA. And I used to be naive enough to think that, hey, I can do both just by myself. I can test the application, but while I'm testing the application, I can also write some code. How wrong was I? I mean... It's impossible. It's a full-time job if you to automate the test and to maintain the test suite. 
it's going to be a full-time job and you will need a dedicated person for that. So, as I, uh, I, I want to say, I don't know if anybody actually made that statement, but I'll make it. Uh, first casualty of agile work environment is documentation, which is a very, very sad state of affairs. I mean, if you're going to try to keep up with the documentation, by the time you're done, your documentation is outdated. We don't need, you, you don't have the time to make binders and binders and binders of every single feature written out. Just nobody will be able to keep up with that. The next part is that there's no uh, written test cases for the manual testers to speak of. Uh, personally, I don't think that's such a bad thing. Uh, I don't believe in test cases. I don't believe in humongous binders again. Um, if you disagree with me, come talk to me. I'll try to convert you. And then um, you constantly need to deliver your application to the customers. If you do not deliver new features quickly, customers will start losing interest in you because you're not the hot new product in town. The, you need to give them something to keep them coming back for more and more. You need to stay ahead of your competition. So at Groupon, we do weekly deploys. Uh, we practice a lot of the DevOps mantras. Uh, we believe that new features should go out into production at least once a week. This is, uh, and I'm not, not not necessarily talking about the features that are customer facing. There's also features for the internal teams, but basically you need to push things out. Uh, when there's bugs, you need to get them fixed fast. Otherwise, people get frustrated. Otherwise, you have a whole floor of people, of salespeople who are not able to do their work, which loses you money. So it is better to deploy often. And uh, we actually get very, very nervous. So once in a while, we have to push off a deploy from one time a week to once every two weeks. And so everybody just kind of, <gasps> oh, no, this is going to be miserable. Because the next, uh, after you don't deploy for two weeks, so much changed in the code base that when you finally deploy, there's just so many bugs all over the place. And now you have to spend the whole day trying to track those bugs down. Whereas if you deploy once a week, hey, you, all the developers, uh, they have the code fresh in their mind. They know about the features. You get worst case scenario, you roll back, and that little tiny, f tiny feature goes away. Nobody notices. I had a chance to talk to the developers at IMVU. They are doing some crazy stuff there. They deploy up to 50 to 100 times a day. Now, it sounds insane, but there, uh, uh, at the bottom, there's the blog by the IMVU guys. Anyways, the, what they do is they write some code. It runs through a whole lot of test cases. When the code is finished and all the build is green, they right away promote it to production. There is no person who's al always pushing the button. It's completely automated. If the t uh, build fails, it, uh, it is rejected out of the uh, source code. The developer has to go back and fix all the tests. So in order to accomplish something like this, you really, really need to have a very nice culture where the developers and QAs and everybody are working together to improve the quality of the code. So let's talk about these first two points. The too expensive and it's too much work to create. If it's too expensive, well, don't buy Quick Test Pro. Last time I checked, there was ton uh, tens of thousands of dollars per single license. Uh, it's been a couple of years, so I don't know. This is why we're here. Selenium is free. There's other tools out there. Use the free tools. If you're talking about manpower, well, you will have to sacrifice somebody to be to maintain the uh, test cases. The way I, I, I like to think about it is, what is the expense of a bug going out into production? If the expense is very low and your pain tolerance is low, then hey, no big deal. You don't need as much automation. But if for every hour that you're down, your, your company is losing a million dollars, maybe it's a small price to pay to have a couple of people dedicated to writing and maintaining automated uh, test suites. So th too much work to create. Again, you it is a lot of work, no matter how you put it. Uh, so Cucumber, where where is Cucumber going to come in for you? Basically, Cucumber is a BDD framework that will help you do TDD and other TLAs. Um, it will improve your Agile. It will 
do paradigm shifts and it will do some other buzzwords so you too can be buzzword compliant. Uh, I, I, I love salespeople. I, uh, I have nothing against them, but I just like to quote them from time to time. Anyways, uh, what a cucumber test looks like. Uh, I hope everybody can see it, but this is an actual quick test that I put together. It's a feature description. Uh, the simple breakdown is the little at tags. Those are tags. I will cover those in a minute. But the green part is the feature description of the uh, product that you're trying to test. So this is the registration. This is a customer purchasing. This is some sort of a feature. Describe that feature. Tell, tell, you, tell everybody what you're trying to accomplish with this test. And then within the, uh, the test, you have this yellow part, which are the scenarios. Say, customer purchases with a Visa card or customer purchases with a MasterCard. Break those down, break those scenarios down successful registration, failed registration. And within each scenario, now you have a little steps. Uh, the givens are the uh, basically the setup. Hey, given I have a browser and I'm already on Google's homepage, or given I'm using Firefox, or given I'm using Internet Explorer, you, you name it. Those things will, be those, those little pieces of uh, code will set up the environment for you so that the test can, can begin. The ands and uh, givens are kind of the same thing. So ands then will say, okay, and I do this function, or I click on, uh, I try to register, or I try to basically execute some something. Now, I do not believe that the ands and the uh, step definitions need to be uh, technical. Actually, I'm completely against that. If you're gonna if you're gonna put it in into a step definition saying hey, click on div ID something. That's just a terrible approach to, to it. You need to describe your application in the words that anybody in your company can understand and they can go through and they can uh, understand what you're trying to test. And then then statements are your basically your assertions. Translated into Ruby, the, that looks something like this. The given I'm um, on a home uh, Google's or Bing's homepage, you do uh, Selenium open or whatever the if you're using Selenium two whatever is the equivalent, you you do a uh, search type, and then you have some assertions. Now, kind of weird thing I found that uh, when you do hello world on uh, Google, the first article that comes back is actually Wikipedia that explains what hello world is. For some reason on Bing it's some videos. I never understood that, but maybe that's the reason Google is still winning. <coughs> um, so, moving on. You don't have enough staff to maintain your test. You don't have enough staff to actually write the test. This leads to an interesting question. Who should be writing the tests? I, I was asked this uh, question at, a, at an interview, and I thought, well, what a simple question. I mean, it's almost, it sounds like a simple trick question. Who should be writing the test in your team? I mean, obviously, it's the developers. They will write your unit test. They will write your integration test. They will write your functional test. But then, OK, where do the QAs come in? They, you want the QAs to also test manually, but they also have a lot of input of the uh, overarching uh, flow of the application. So why don't why not have the QAs write the test cases also? Okay, so they can do some functional tests that the QAs can write. Maybe they can do end-to-end -end because developers tend to stick to you know tiny unit tests. They don't want to think about the start to end, the whole happy path or the whole miserable path of the application. But why not add one more level? Why not get everybody else in your team involved? Why not get the business analyst involved? Why not get the project managers involved? I mean, those are the guys who want the application to be delivered, and they have certain needs and they have certain desires of how the application needs to function. So why not get the project managers and the business analysts to write the step definition of the test? If you can get them to just use the simple format I showed you earlier, they can write out the application acceptance, and then they can attach those acceptance criteria to the stories in whatever tracker you're using. 
and make it a part of the story. That way, when you are done uh, looking at the story, you have instantly the test cases also, which is also helpful for the QAs. Nobody, nobody has the time to keep up with the uh, actual test cases. So if the developers and QAs are actively keeping up with the automated test cases, why not reuse those same test cases for your, uh, as a guideline for your manual testing? That way you can actually understand the application. The newcomers can come in and read. Uh, I, I hear this all the time. It's like, well, the tests are very useful for newcomers who to the team to uh, find out what the application is look, uh, does and how it's supposed to behave. And um, th the problem with that is if you're not very technical, the regular unit tests, they make no sense. The integration tests, they make no sense. This sort of can make sense to anybody, no matter how technical or non-technical they are. Uh, never know. The next step is you never know the coverage level. I want to answer that question. It's, 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 it's a tough one. I honestly don't have a good answer. Maybe somebody out there will come up with an idea. But so far, this is the only idea that uh, I was in a ThoughtWorks project with a uh, uh, coworker, Tim Camper, and uh, had this crazy idea. Well, why not use mind maps to show test cases and how they, they work? You know, Just if you tag the test correctly and parse the test output and then throw it on a mind map, that way you have both the top view, OK, we have 20% of the test cases are cover, uh, failing. And you can also drill down into a single test case. And better yet, um, don't have the mouse, but I as you can see, registration and login actually has zero test case coverage. So just an idea. Maybe somebody want to take it and run with it. It's relatively easy to generate these char uh, charts with uh, FreeMind. It's just an XML file, th add more nodes, say, hey, this one passed, this one failed. And uh, no one but the developers know what is being tested again. If the features are written in simple uh, language, then even the CEO of the company can understand, hey, we are testing the registration, and this is what we're doing on the registration page. So let's talk about the good features of Cucumber. Um, first of all is the tags. The tags are amazing. They're your friends. Uh, we try to implement tagging system for Selenium tests before. It was ridiculously clunky. It always broke. Cucumber takes care of it for you. So when you're looking at the step definitions, these are your tags. The tags that are at the top of the screen apply to the whole file, and then you can have individual tests tagged separately. This is great because now you can say, hey, I only want to run all my tests that are for Google, or I only want to run the registration test, or I only want to run the visa test. On top of that, uh, when you're using Cucumber and Selenium, you can uh, put at Selenium or a JavaScript tag on a test, and that test will be executed in the browser versus in a headless browser. Uh, it encourages the behavior-driven testing uh, development, uh, test-driven development, and behavior-driven development. Now. If, you are, if your company does not do test-driven development, you really, really, really need to research it. The developers really need to put an effort up front to make better quality software. It's a, it's a team effort. Like it, it's not the QA's job anymore to make sure that the quality of the code and uh, there, there's no bugs in production. It's not only the QA's who are responsible for this anymore. It is also the developer's job. And this is where the developers can come in. If they write the tests ahead of time and th they have enough tests, you can catch a lot of bugs very quickly. Uh, to those of you who are not familiar with test-driven development, the idea is very simple. Write the test up front, run it, see it fail, write a little piece of functionality that, uh, uh, that the test is trying to test. When the test uh, succeeds, you're done. Move on to the next feature. This is great for uh, Cucumber because it sort of starts, forces you to do that. If you have a, um, a feature file and you try to run the test, this is the output you get. And as you can see, the yellow step, uh, step definitions are the ones that are not yet complete. Those are the ones that the developer needs to then go and write some functionality and some test to run against. Uh, so if you have the business analyst and those guys, 
just create and write up the step definitions, attach them to a file or give them to the developers. Developers can now start working and writing code around the features instead of just writing code and then having to test. As you start uh, later on in the output, it gives you actually a couple of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, step definition definitions that you can put. You so you just copy and paste it into your file, and all of a sudden you have some uh, step definitions. Then you have to define it. And so as you're defining them one at a time, those steps become green. When they're all green, you're done with the feature. You can pass it off to the QAs. It's 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 a great concept. That by the time the code gets to the QAs, you don't have to deal with all the little tiny problems that just prevent you from working all day. I I've been doing uh, test-driven development with uh, my team for a long time, and I'm not switching back because I don't have to waste half the day trying to figure out, oh, the application won't even launch. Okay, well, there's tests that cover that. Cucumber covers a bunch of different uh, testing platforms, Selenium being one of them. It covers both Selenium 1 and Selenium 2. In, case of Cap uh, in my case, we're using uh, Selenium 2 with Capybara. Steam and uh, Celerity, Celerity. Those guys didn't have, uh, you know, a logo, so I just went to Wikipedia and got them something. Uh, and water it drives all of the waters for you. So you have, if if you use Cucumber, you are no longer tied to any given test framework, which is very very freeing if you think about it. If you can have half of your tests run in a headless browser, like. Uh, uh, WebRat or one of the other ones, you will save a lot of time on loading times because that, that is the biggest problem with Selenium right now. It takes too long. Now, if you're not testing JavaScript, if you're only testing that when I click register, the registration page come up, comes up, you don't need to have the browser running. You can do it in a headless browser. That's where Capybara really helps out because it seamlessly switches you between a Selenium driver or web dri WebRat driver or any other headless driver you want. This is what um, Selenium uh, step uh, setup looks like in Ruby. So the before block is a little block that gets called before every single individual scenario is ran. And in this block, I'm just setting up a new Selenium driver for Selenium 1. And this way, I'm going to have a brand new driver, everything clean. Uh, the browser will come up every single time. It's that easy to set up. If you want to reuse the browser, don't put it inside of the before scenario. Put it somewhere else and just reuse the same browser session again and again. That will speed things up. But if you actually need to have a new browser session every time, this is actually a pretty decent solution. Um, a little tip, if you're using Ruby and you're using uh, Selenium 1, use HPercard or Nokogiri. I'm telling you, this will save your life a lot. It will make you a happy, happy person. All you have to do is say, hey, page, and then pass the HTML from your Selenium driver into the HPercard or Nokogiri object. and all of a sudden you have an HTML DOM object that you can easily browse up and down into. Uh, let me give you an example. So on a project that I was on, we had this page. We, we called it the bug page, big, ugly grid. We have a lot of flights that we need to cover. Let me zoom in. So how do you, uh, how do you verify that the 6 a.m. flight is $178 and that the 7.30 p.m. flight is uh, $178. If you just try to use, uh, make sure, uh, what is it, verify element is present or ver verify text is present, Selenium will just pick the first instance of it and say, hey, it's good. But what about the rest of the flights? How, how are you going to go through them? If you are using Nokigiri or HPercot, you can actually go th one cell at a time and verify that every single item in every single row appears to what you want it to appear. It's very, very awesome in that respect. Selenium 2 support, as I mentioned, Selenium and Capybara, they're completely in love. They're awesome. If you mix Selenium, Capybara, and Rails, well, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, Capybara is great for because it uses Nokogiri out of the box, so all the features that I was talking about, being able to verify every single element individually is great. It uses XPath outside of the browser, so uh, 
what, what is the cell line? Do not use XPath with Selenium because Internet Explorer does not support XPath in a good way and your test will take forever to run. I like XPath, but so you can use XPath out of the, uh, without the browser and it will work consistently every time. You can use CSS selector, it's up to you. And um, Capybara actually works really well outside of Rails, so uh, check out that project if you're interested. So let's talk about multilingual things with uh, Cucumber. If you want your developers to keep up with, the, uh, with writing tests, make sure that the tests are written in the same language that they're using to develop the, the application. We made a mistake of trying to convince uh, Java developers that they need to write the tests in Ruby. That didn't go so well. I was the only one that was writing tests. None of the developers had the time to actually go and uh, learn Ruby, understand what's going on. So if you're, if, you're, if you're a Java project, why don't you write your test in Java? If you are in Python, use Python. This is what a Java step definition looks like for Cucumber. So Cucumber is written in Ruby, but it can execute uh, Java steps for you or any other language that you wish. Um, Cuke for Duke is the, uh, is the cool little project that takes care of a lot of that. The next thing about Cucumber that rules is the international <laughs> I18N tags. Basically, like, what if you're working with a company that is s speaks a different language than you do? What if, um, well, I'm Russian, so this makes me happy. Like, this is a step definition written out in Russian for you. This is uh, uh, the same step definition written out in Chinese for you. And if you have a lot of cats, this is the lols version of the thing. So you can write your test definitions in the language that your business actually speaks. You don't have to be tied to English when you're writing the tests. I mean, that, that's just awesome, especially when you have to deal with uh, teams that are, you know, in China or in France or in India. You write in their own language. Everybody understands and everybody's happy. Well, if I'm writing... Chinese test, uh, I guess that'll be difficult for me, but you know, Google Translate or something like that. So, readable test results, I don't think it gets even uh, any more readable than this. When you're running a test and you see, oh, which test case, I mean, which step failed, it's uh, wh when you're looking in Hudson or something, it's actually quite easy to understand, like, oh, okay, this is where the problem is, I'm gonna jump straight down to it. A couple of bad features of uh, Cucumber, um, regex, we use regex to define the steps, which, uh, which is good because your steps can be reused many, many times and you can say, hey, I wa when I add these two numbers, the number that I'm expecting is 10 or 20 or 30 and you can just change the number and capture that number. The bad part about it is sometimes your step definitions look like this, and this is one of the simpler ones. I've seen a step definition that's just nothing but characters of you know stars and stuff. When you're trying to find, when you, when you have when you're looking at the feature and you're trying to find that step definition, you cannot just do Control F, find me that de step definition. You have to kind of crawl around. A uh, couple of tools that help out. Uh, Cucumber has uh, Cucumber. Um, Sorry, TextMate has Cucumber TM bundle that sort of works. I, not very reliable for me. RubyMind actually works really well with uh, Cucumber out of the box, and I hear that VM Vim Rails works for the Vim lovers, lovers out there. A couple other bad features is that Cucumber tends to be slower. It has to use a language parser, and uh, if, if, if you're not careful, your step definitions are going to be all over the place. You're going to spend a lot of time trying to find those steps. So this is one of uh, most the biggest reasons I've heard developers not wanting to use Cucumber. It's a bit of a religious war, actually, Cucumber versus RSpec. One, one side is like, hey, RSpec rules, we should always use that. The other side, well, Cucumber is useful. People will be fighting it's like Max versus PCs. I don't think we'll ever hear an end to it, but it has it does have some bad features to it, so just keep that in mind. In conclusion, I do want to mention that Cucumber is a great tool. It enables your team to work closer together. It enables your business to know what's going on with the, the development and understand what you're trying to test. It is a good way to document features. I mean, if it's a, the, the reason it's so good is because 
those tests will always be up to date. Unlike the binder of documentation that you have sitting on your desk, which nobody ever updates, these tests, somebody will actually have to keep updating them to make them pass. If they fail, then everybody needs to rush over and fix the broken tests. And um, it does have a couple of downsides. I want to quote DHH. The, this is the guy who uh, wrote Rails on this. Um, basically, he says, RSpec offends me aesthetically with no dis uh, discernible benefit for its added complexity over test unit. And if you ever used RSpec, you will understand it's just it's, it's ugly. And Cucumber makes no sense to me unless you have clients reading the test. Why would you build a test-specific parser? However, the important part is that there needs to be more tests. So the tools that you use n need to be the whole religious war of this tool versus that one. Maybe we need to put it aside and instead increase the test coverage of your application instead of trying to find over my minor details here and there. Um, I just want to mention that we are hiring at Groupon. We're looking for QAs and uh, uh, developers. Uh, see me, I have some business cards. Here's the website. And I think I'll take some questions if there are any. If, if not, then, oh, yes. OK, so the question is, uh, what is the uh, performance difference between using uh, Selenium by itself versus using Selenium and Cucumber? the parsing part of the actual test cases. Um, let's see, we have, we have about 12,000 uh, integration and unit tests that are written in Cucumber and about uh, 200 uh, Selenium tests. So for the 12,000 uh, features that are integration tests, I'd say it takes about uh, 20, 30 seconds to parse all of that. So it's it's actually not that terrible. All the all the parsing is done up front, and then once the parsing is done, it just says, okay, execute this test, execute this test. So it's it's not that bad. Yeah. So are we able to write uh, get the business people to write cucumber scenarios? Um, it's a little tough. Uh, at ThoughtWorks, it was actually relatively easy because um, all the business people were on board with. You know, no matter what you tell them, they're like, yes, let's give it a try. So uh, on some of the ThoughtWorks projects, it was actually quite awesome. Uh, currently, we are convincing. It's, it's, it's a bit of a struggle to convince a project manager to or the business analyst to write the acceptance test. Right now, we're still fighting with them to actually write acceptance test in the first place instead of just stories that say, hey, this is what the story is. Uh, we believe that the story is not done until you have some acceptance tests. But if once you cross that hurdle and you can convince them to provide some acceptance criteria, it's not that hard to get them to uh, say, hey, okay, instead of providing a bullet list of the acceptance criteria, can you just write it out in this long form? So, yeah, we basically you can get business people to cooperate. Uh, so... Uh, some of the recommendations to switch people over from um, Quick Test Pro to Selenium. Well, my my biggest point usually is the cost. I mean, the yearly support for Quick Test Pro is ridiculous versus this. But um, if you want to go into some of those other features, I, I also want to point out some features that Quick Test Pro actually misses. So I was able to get a Selenium test with LL Ruby um, to after uh, something is purchased and you have a PDF receipt that is given back to you, download that receipt and verify that the, all the stuff in the PDF are, you know, your name is there and the receipt is actually correct. I don't see Quick Test Pro doing that. Uh, there's a lot of other cool tools that are built into open source projects that really help out. For the dashboard part, uh, we use Hudson. And um, Hudson plus... Uh, it executes all the tests, and then we have um, uh, CI Reporter, I believe is the gem. The, it was um, the guys at Sauce Lab pointed out to us. So the CI uh, Reporter gem outputs all the test results as a standard XML format that Hudson then sucks in and creates all those pretty charts and graphs saying, hey, we have this much test coverage. It's going up. It's going down. This is many tests are failing. It breaks everything down for you. So there's, there's a lot of um, open source solutions you will have to combine them, I guess. 
but they can be done to look as good as uh, uh, QuickTest Pro. Uh, you, I actually w uh, go to the so Cucumber's website uh, is uh, pretty decent. Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you're if you're having difficulties with install, if you're not a Ruby guy and uh, you wanna uh, install Cucumber, you have difficulties with that. So for that information, you cubes that info uh, here, and uh, also the GitHub project for Cucumber. It is very very easy to. Uh, I mean, those guys are very supportive. You usually, um, if you have a bug, they you submit a bug on GitHub and they would fix it for you usually in, in days or sometimes hours. So that's my experience. The community is there. Uh, just the Cucumber website is actually very helpful. I think that they have a very good documented wiki. So I think, I think that would be the best uh. place. So how do we convince the, how do, you, how do you give the business some guidelines on how to write the features up front? Uh, there's sadly no, I haven't seen a single ID right now that will do auto completion for you. So that's a big problem. I'm hoping that somebody's working on it, but I haven't seen it. Uh, the best the best guideline, I, uh, it's just like being very close to the business people and actually, you know, walking through them and ask them to read some previous tests. And then it's like, oh, when I do this, uh, wh when a step definition is written out, Reuse those step definitions word for word, copy and paste. I guess would be the better answer, but that's a, it's a, it's a it's a tough question um, issue, and you know, it just maybe you need to uh, mentor your business people a little bit on that one. So the Java version is actually for um, so when you're looking at the cucumber tests. Let me go back. So these are the step defini uh, the feature definition. So you want to write, uh, you will want to write out your features in natural language. However, you need some code on the back end to actually execute those uh, the the features that you described. And so you the you can use Java or Ruby or something else to actually execute. So uh, the given part, like given I'm on the Google's homepage, if you're using Ruby, then you will say, hey, Selenium.OpenGoogle.com, right? Or in Java equivalent of uh, I haven't used uh, Selenium Java uh, Java Selenium but uh, basically there's a similar act f to open up the web page in Java uh, so the translate uh, so the step uh, are you talking about translating the feature definitions these guys or are you talking about the step definitions to translate them into Java <laughs> okay, so um, basically uh, these guys can be, right now it's written in Ruby, but we can r rewrite all these steps in Java or Python and use them again and again wi without switching the actual feature file. So I guess, I hope that answers the question. Uh, so the two-part question, uh, first one is what are the pain points of maintaining the feature file and second one is how hard is it to integrate with continuous integration? I'll answer the second one first. Uh, very easy uh, to integrate with uh, continuous integration. Instead of running, um, uh, again, I'm in the Ruby world, so instead of running rake selenium tests, I'm running rake cucumber tests. And so have the Hudson or whatever your continuous integration application, just execute that, no problem. Uh, for the pain points, th there are some pain points um, uh, what is it? Duplication. There's a lot of duplication. You have to copy and paste the given steps a lot because you will be reusing them. And th I think that is the biggest problem: is that duplication. Um, so you will every single time you have a scenario, you will have to say, "Given I'm on a Google's web page," or "Given on a, that I'm on a Bing's web page." There's some. Uh, there's some steps around it. You can put a background section, and the background section basically sets up your environment for you before each scenario. But uh, you will still have to. Uh, you cannot. It's kind of difficult. No, hold on. Yeah, uh, there, there's a way to call uh, feature steps from the step uh, from the actual steps. So you know you have a feature that calls a step, which calls another feature. So you can sidetrack some of the duplication, but that that's a big pain point, and the other big pain point that we have with the developers is the uh, uh, there's no autocomplete. And a third pain point that all of the de developers complain about is the uh, 
the step definitions are written in completely regex, and so they're very difficult to find sometimes. If you if you have a poor directory structure, it's going to be very very difficult to find uh, where the uh, uh, steps are defined. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, was that a question? Okay. Yeah. The the yeah, the comment was we can reuse the the tags to uh, basically split up your tests into you know separate test cases. That way you can have a a smoke test, which is part of the regression test, and just execute only the smoke test uh, uh, features. We have uh, uh, we have tests uh, right now. That we're trying to integrate with Sauce Labs, so we have some tests that are marked for local run only, and some tests that are run for Sauce, so that uh, we can run against uh, Internet Explorer and all those other guys. Well, let's see. If from the feature point of view, the te uh, the test will look like something like this. Uh, where is it? So from a feature definition, the test will look like this, uh, but this will be written in French, right? So this is uh, written in Russian, but you can write something like all the step definitions in French. And uh, I, I believe they have French support. They have like a very long list of different languages. So instead of uh, saying hello world, you say whatever the French is equivalent. Or you can still uh, write the feature definitions in English and I guess just uh, change the word uh, hello world to the French equivalent. So. But from the uh, from the actual uh, step definitions, um, I think you would just write them in English. Uh, the test do not need to uh, the test do not need to know the uh, language. All you have to do is make sure that when you are um, writing the uh, when you when you're writing the step definitions, you use the appropriate regex for it. So th that way. Uh, uh, when you have the then statement or end statement, you have the instead of English, you use the French or whatever the equivalent is, so that you g you can track them down and associate them to each other. And um, in this case, uh, like this is the reason this is so complicated is because we're saying we don't care whether it's an I or we, because sometimes you want to write tests for multiple people, and then with uh, I should see some stuff within some. With a uh, uh, what do you call it? Cucumber and Capybara gives you the ability to say, "Hey, I want to see uh, registration link that's inside of this section here, but not the rest of the page." So, but um, this is what it would look like. But instead of English words, you would s you would substitute them with French or Chinese or whichever words you want to use. Uh, yes, yes, and this is um, uh, so Cucumber does uh, allow you to reuse uh, data. Uh, on. And I need to show you their website for this real quick. So this is their website. What it allows you to do, if I can find that feature really, really quickly, is uh, build tables of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, build tables of the input data. And so you can have a very, very large uh, uh, table of saying, hey, register with all these possible scenarios here. I've seen it just a minute ago. So these are the languages that are supported. Um, let me look. Division feature, nope. Uh, yeah, there it is. So th this test now will uh, run through these examples every single time. And as many as there are examples, it will try to fill it out for you again and again and again. Uh, the other feature that I heard people talk about uh, is the ability to read tables. So instead of... Uh, uh whoa. Not my calendar. Um anyways, uh the uh what do you call it? Um uh, ability to basically read a whole page uh, tables and sneak those out. I never use that because I just parse the page myself, but Cucumber allows you to search through that. So okay. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you.